Welcome to episode 156 of the Bandhive Podcast. It is time for another episode of the Bandhive Podcast. My name is James Cross, and I help independent artists tour smart. This week, I have a really special guest, John James Ryan of the band Keep Flying. How are you doing today, man? Got the Topo Chico in hand. We're ready to rock and roll. Come on now. Aw, sick. It's the rock and roll lifestyle. You're traveling. You just wrapped up a tour like a week and a half ago, and you're already away from home again. That's the lifestyle, I tell you, man. I know it's tough, but if you're in a DIY band, that's kind of how it is, right? I think pre-pandemic, it was for way more people. I think post-pandemic, you see a lot more resistance and or straight up defeat from a lot of smaller artists. And respectfully so. I don't say that in a disrespectful way. I've I, Literally this week, I've seen multiple acquaintances, bands or solo projects making these rogue posts like, hi, I, I just can't do this. I can't afford to tour in this capacity. I, I just can't. I'm going to peace out for a little bit and I'm going to work on music and see you guys soon. And I'm like, yeah, I know I get that because even on the bigger scale with a lot of the bands that I have been involved with work-wise or whatever, a full tour is like three and a half weeks where it used to be six and a half. Everyone's kind of dialing back because even on that scale, a lot of these artists, I'm, well, I went to a show last night, stop by and see some friends. And one of those bands, I'm not going to mention, but they've been a band for quite a long time. And I don't think that they've ever made income ever off their band. In fact, I believe that they're in an extreme amount of debt still. Like you really have to start to like, is like the joy I get from playing worth the fact that I'm actually just regressing certain parts of my life. Kind of interesting and sad. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, especially, first of all, the pandemic can throw a wrench in a tour so quickly. Like one person gets COVID. This just happened to a friend's band. They had to cancel the last three shows because one of the members got COVID. Now they're driving home like 800 miles without any shows. That sucks. The other thing is with the cost of everything rising so rapidly, especially gas, it's getting more and more expensive too. I'm sure you know the used car, used van game is unacceptable. Like you're talking vans that were 6,500, people are trying to sell for 14 grand now. And just like the gas increases for merchandise, the cost of the blanks, the cotton, just this year, it's gone up four times in one year. I'm sure people are seeing that the bands are charging five more dollars or 10 more dollars for a t-shirt. And it's because, well, they're paying like four dollars and change more than they were one year ago. Yeah, it's truly amazing. I remember like 10 years ago, you could get a small run of shirts for like six to seven dollars each one color. And like five years ago, it's still about the same. It was a dollar more. And now it's basically twice what it was 10 years ago. It just skyrocketed. And for the small band like us, We're not really making money on what comes through the door. Like we hope that the door money is helping us get to break even with the expense. We hope it's really all in like selling the records and a couple t-shirts that was like, okay, well, after the cost of those items, we profited 260 bucks today. Cool. Thank God we're not getting a hotel room and we're staying with a friend because otherwise that number would become 160 bucks. And then the gas is going to be another nine. $7 to fill the tank. All right. Now we're at $80. You're chipping away at it constantly. It's really, really unfortunate. And that's a big part of what I want to talk about on the show today is just the actual model of being in a DIY touring band. Because as much as we can talk about like, hey, go do this in the ideal world, the tours that happen are never the ideal world. Like something is going to go wrong at all times. And knowing that you have this background of touring with larger acts, which I found out about after we scheduled the interview. So that's a really happy coincidence. I just absolutely want to pick your brain about all this stuff. So before we jump into this, Keep Flying is six members, which is large. I mean, for a ska band, that's somewhat typical. But still, for the average DIY band, that's a little bit on the bigger side. And that obviously adds to all the costs. Aside from all that, can you give us a basic rundown of the history of the band, which was started back in like 2016, 2017? Yeah, I mean, the current lineup is only two of us from the beginning. It's just Henry, my singer, and myself. Peter, our drummer, came in very quickly after the beginning. We had a guy who started the band who I don't think realized we were going to be like an actual band that wanted to do the thing. So he very quickly, after three shows, was like, wait a minute, no, I can't do this. 
and Pete came right in, which is great. And he's been here ever since. And Pete is actually the only member of the band that has never missed a show. So I would like to say that that fact takes away the fact that he did not actually record on the first EP and we just pretend like he has. You know what I mean? Yeah, props to Pete for that. We've lost a couple people along the way as far as like people deciding that they didn't want to do the band anymore, which is totally fine and respectable. And then we've gained people that want to do this more than the same amount that I do, which is what I needed personally for this band. We picked up Chuck along the way playing bass and doing all of the harmonies and some of his own vocals now. And he's just happy to be on the road at all times, which is great. And then Ricky came in on the secondary horn, which was great again for Henry because him and Henry, we used to be in a band together for many years. And good for me because I've been friends with Rick since my first band played Buffalo in 2006. And his old crappy bands like played with my old band many times in North Tonawanda, New York. And here we are now. And Rick is like, when it comes to the business, he's like the first guy I call to talk about like merch designs or routes or things like he's the first guy because he's the one who answers the fastest. Truthfully, no shade at my guys, but he's the guy. More recently, we lost our other guitar player and we gained our friend Dustin, who also has been my friend for a long, long time. And he was in a band called With the Punches, and he has brought a great, uplifting, positive attitude, energy to the band, as well as he shreds on guitar. And we just finished a new record. The guitar stuff he did is just a thing that we've never had before. And so, yeah, I'm just like really excited about the current lineup of the band. But I am very grateful to all of the previous artists and musicians that were in this band that helped with the songwriting and or the business of doing the band. I, I appreciate all of them, I'm still friends with all of them. And most of them will randomly pick up an instrument and play a song with us. Like we have that good relationship still, which is good. And uh, I think I have their blessing as well. That's fantastic. Judging by the fact that you say, hey, all of these new members are people you've been friends with for a decade, decade and a half, whatever. You don't seem like the type of person to burn bridges, which makes me think also those ex-members would absolutely give you their blessing. Like just on the quick description that you've given. Yes, but don't get me wrong. Like I am a human being as well. And I've definitely had my share of long-term friends who just suddenly have walked out and vice versa. But I feel that that is very okay and very human. I used to push against that for a really long time. And now especially during the pandemic, everybody's tree, this was said to me by somebody else when I was coping with my loss of some friends, everybody's tree had to be shook for the best because the coconuts that stay when the tree is shaking, those are the ones you want anyway. The ones that fall out is not what you want. And also another little like blurb that I often read when I have to remind myself of like letting go of things, which I have a hard time with, is not everybody is going to be on your path at all times. And when it comes to keep flying, that's why some of these guys did leave because their path changed. Trying to force someone on your path ain't gonna do them any service and it's certainly not gonna do me or anyone any service. Like just let it naturally go and maybe that path might run parallel. But even if it's parallel, it may not be the same path. And maybe it'll come back. But like, once I've accepted that, now I get to look at all those pockets of my life and be like, that era with those people when things were good was awesome. And I'm glad that that's the memories that I have now because now I know how this person is. And my Lord, I couldn't possibly be their friend now. And I'm sure vice versa for other people when it comes to me, like, Man, I kept being a joker who just kept touring on the road constantly and like had a really hard time committing to anything outside of road life and, and music. And I think after a while, there are some people in my life who were like, can't really have a fair weather friend like you. You're never around. Like you're one of my close friends, but you're not here ever. And like I forget to call sometimes. And so I do get it. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just personally speaking, that's why I quit touring too. Like for me is like, I don't want to be on the road for more than two weeks at a time now. So I'm done. I understand the sentiment completely. That's why current iteration of Keep Flying and before this, we often play shows where someone or someone's has to miss. 
anywhere from one to a whole tour because of whatever other priority is happening in their life. And we're very outspoken and transparent with each other these days. And it makes it a lot easier to be like, okay, that's cool. We have like this line of a couple friends who can fill in on a whim. And so we're able to be like, hey man, no big deal. Cool. Thank you for letting us know in advance so we can rehearse with whoever. And we're just going to go still rock it anyway, just because we hate canceling. We as a band hate, hate to cancel. Yeah, it's no fun. And half the time you've already sunk in at least some form of investment into a show. So canceling means you're out on that investment. It's never fun. And I kind of want to highlight on what you're saying about people that you used to be friends with and you aren't now. Everything is a learning experience in life. And I know this isn't necessarily specific to music, but that's just such a good point you made there is you learn over time. And what I love to say is the day we stop learning is the day we start dying. And I have no idea who said that originally. I stole that from someone. What you're saying is a perfect illustration of that. And the fact that you're adapting and you're learning about how other people are, like I think that's something that's so important for anyone who's in a business with business partners to understand. And any band is a business if you're not just you know playing the local bar once a month. If you're actually playing shows, going on tour, even if it's not with the intent to necessarily make it a career, it's still a business. It's a side hustle maybe, but it's still a business. Or if you do want to make it a career, that's huge. So going further, you're one of the business minds in Keep Flying. What is like your official role, if you can sum it up in the band? I got to be completely honest, because I've been having this combo with my bandmates like this week. And I say this with no ego, just fact. It's almost all me at this point. The band is all of our baby. But as far as like not playing the shows or sitting in the studio, everything else is like me, which is cool because I did that same kind of thing for the bands that I all used to work for, whether it was no members of the band being involved with me coming up with ideas or one. It's never been more than that. It's always been like, it's mostly me. In fact, my old bands that I joined after a X amount of time in the back in the day, all of a sudden it was kind of like put on my plate that like, you're going to do the stuff. Otherwise, we're not going to really be a band because I can't do it anymore. And that's kind of where that mentality first started. It's like, I can't rely on someone else. So I'm going to just make sure I get it done myself. Not to say that I can't rely on my current bandmates. That's not it. But it's like, if I have a timetable, I just want it done. So it's all of it. You're the mastermind behind the project, essentially. And it, it didn't start that way. When Keep Flying started, I was like a supportive friend of my friend Henry, who was happy to be asked to record on an EP of songs that I thought were awesome. And then in the studio, I was like, oh, I'm in on this. But just so you know, I'm not going to be able to do as much of the stuff touring wise, because I'm very committed to like working for these bands, which over the last six years has very quickly switched around the other way. I prioritize the band over any work for any band. Now, there's no question about it because I fell in love with it. I kid you not. We played a house show in New Paltz years ago in our friend's basement. And I was like, oh, my God, this is why I've been so sad the last six years. I can't believe I didn't have this. And I was just helping other people live my dream for so long. I can't go back to that full time. I have to make this something. Here we are, you know, still trying. It's still a lot of work to be done. And we're still willing to bust our ass because truthfully, even when it's like we're playing a show to 34 people, 39 or 41 people, whatever it was in Burlington, Vermont on a Tuesday evening, I'm still happy to be there more than wherever the hell else I was going to be that day if I wasn't doing that. And I have to say like, as somebody who has seen probably way too many local bands, and I don't mean that in any disrespectful way, I'm sure you're in the same boat, the amount of energy you brought to that set, I've known of Keep Flying for probably five years because of my friends who are all Survey Says fans and now Keep Flying fans. I was like, cool, yeah, they're good, I dig it. And I saw the band play live, I was like, that's fantastic. Because I've never seen, at that specific venue at Monkey House in Winooski, Vermont, I've never seen a band put that much effort into their set. And from one standpoint, like you're a very easygoing band. You borrowed gear from everyone. You just showed up with your instruments and said, cool, we'll play what's here. Which 
you know, you'd arrange that with the other acts on the show, of course. It wasn't just that you showed up and said, okay, whose gear are we using? But you're not saying, oh, no, we need to bring our own gear to do our show, blah, 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 blah. You just show up and you play what's available. And you killed it. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about is this was a Canadian tour and you were just heading back through Vermont on the way back. Was that specific to the Canadian tour or is that how you do most of your tours with Keep Flying? That you just tour very low production and use what's available? Man, like you said earlier, it's, well, how can I save money for the business? Well, if I don't have to bring a trailer because we can work out borrowing gear for all of these shows, then we're going to save money. That's how we're going to be able to do this maybe more than other bands our size. I totally understand why why other bands either one can't use other people's gear or two prefer their own. That's fine. But like we're kind of just a punk band and we can get away with doing that. We try to do that all the time. Any way we can. Like for instance, we we have a run with Les and Jake coming up and Cliff Divers on there. I haven't hit up their team yet, but I am going to hit them up soon and ask is there any way we can share your drum shells? Because then if we don't have to bring a drum kit on this tour, we could probably get away again with no trailer, squeeze in six larger men into a, a van with everything piled. But we could probably get it done, but only if we can borrow the drum shells. I mean, we always offer money for drum heads and like however we can do to make it. We load the gear in and out for them. We always offer that. Or we'll do the trade where we'll be like, don't bring cabs, we'll bring our cabs if we can use your drum shells, that will help us both. And we've had good fortune with that. So no, that's always. But playing Vermont specifically on this time was because we got offered a show in Montreal. And I was like, okay, well, if the Canadian tour is going to end over there, then we're going to come through Vermont. Why wouldn't we at least try to throw a Vermont show together, an upper Vermont show? Because we always play South Vermont. We don't get to play Burlington as often. And personally... I love playing in New England, specifically upper New England. So any opportunity that I have to add something in that region, I do. Even though the shows are smaller and there's less people, and I love playing those places because it's awesome. I take a lot of pride in playing places that most bands play no times. Like a lot of the bands I've worked for have never played Vermont ever, or maybe they played higher ground one time in their career. That's it. They've never done New Hampshire ever. And I'm like, man, the bungalow in Manchester, New Hampshire was like our most played venue for the first few years as a band, more than home. And that's crazy. I think that's fantastic because what you're saying is absolutely correct. Like this area is starved for art. And it kind of seems like there's a few bands that get it. Like Jimmy World regularly comes through here. And there's bands smaller than them or slightly larger that just don't come through here. Sick Puppies, back when they were touring a lot, would always come through here. Silver Sun Pickups is pretty good. And then there's bands that just completely ignore it. And you know they could sell 600 tickets at higher ground if they come through. Because we have a great alt-rock radio station here that played all these, you know, like mid-2000s, emo, pop-punk, whatever bands. So you know it would sell. In defense, I could be wrong, but I'm fairly certain that all the years with higher ground, I think it's the same way. I believe they are a door deal venue. So I believe that, you know, a lot of artists can't take that gamble on what if the show doesn't do great, we don't make the money we need to even pay off whatever the expenses and the crew and all that, like music industry, music business stuff, where that's tough for a band to justify. So if you don't want to go and play Vermont because you don't care or know how beautiful it is, you're not going to even waste your time. No offense. Yeah. No, that's very fair. And I think, you know, Higher Ground themselves probably realize that not every show is going to be a winner. And that's why they're not offering a guarantee or a or versus or a plus or whatever other kind of deals they couldn't have. I think it's a nonprofit. Yeah, it might be a B Corp or something. I'd have to look into that more. They can't take the risk either. And also another factor there, a lot of larger bands that are not as involved in their business have no say in what's happening or care to have any say in what's happening with their tour routing. They just get the date set and go, sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw a great example of that January of this year with all the bands who are like, we're not playing when we were young. And a day later, oh, actually we are. Our manager booked that and just didn't know how big the lineup was. It's like, yep. So <laughs> I got to say, I think it's a great model that you have about just traveling as light as possible, saving those costs. And 
you know, like you mentioned, some artists rely on that having their production, their setup, you know, especially if they have like an in-ear rig, it's easier if they have their own stuff because then it's all set up the way they want it, all that kind of stuff. But all that production, like I can go see a huge production band and be really impressed with the production and be like, they still look wicked bored on stage, which Keep Flying does not. You see Keep Flying and it's insane. You could play with anything and just the show would be amazing because of the energy in the stage presence. Many times, especially in smaller places, we never have production, but we'll like find stuff in the venue to grab and throw around on stage and make like these silly, funny moments. Man, I'm just up there having fun. Years ago, I was told by an old bandmate that I was too goofy on stage. I have never really stopped shaking that. It was something said to me that really just bothered me because I was like, come on. I'm yeah. adding so much like fun. I'm genuinely up here happy to be here. And sometimes it comes out aggressive. And I, or sometimes I get choked up when I'm thinking about a sad thing. Or But sometimes I'm just in a good mood and happy to be moving around and being a little extra silly. I also have ADHD. And once I get moving, I'm, I'm like moving. And so things just happen sometimes. You know what I mean? My bad. Again, to each their own. Uh, you know, if you're playing music like Turnover, Maybe you're not up on stage doing silly stuff and moving because their music is a vibe. It's chill. I love their band. If they were doing what I did on stage, I'd be very confused as to what the hell was happening. This doesn't make any sense. This is the slowest mid-tempo song I've ever heard. Yeah, it's definitely genre specific. You know, I wouldn't expect to see like an indie band jumping around like you do. But I also think they can still bring energy to it that's appropriate for that so they don't look completely bored which is what a lot of artists kind of look like. A lot of those bands make it up with, they spend the money on having like a really unbelievable light show. Our band, if we added lights, that would just be another thing. But like, we don't need the lights because we're already moving around so much, the whole band. But like, I've seen a lot of bands that they just stand there, but when they have the crazy light show and the production and whatever tracks and like in between interlude stuff, I'm like, my God. Godspeed, you Black Emperor, they don't move, not a muscle. When I saw them at Trocadera in Philly with my buddy years ago, I was like crying. I was like wiped out. And there was no movement, no one in the crowd moving and no one on stage moving. And I left there like wiped out in a good way. And it was like that band knows how to do that. That was a beautiful thing to see. But again, if, if you can't emulate something similar to that and you're just standing around, you know what happens. People get bored and they go on the internet and they write that. And I see it often with a lot of artists. It's like, this band just was there and then the set was over. Sure. I don't want someone to say that about my band. I'd rather someone be upset at how much we moved and upset with the amount of spit that comes out of my mouth on stage, which I've had complained to me before. But lady, I'll tell you, when you're jumping around on stage doing a P90X program and you're playing a woodwind instrument and you have overactive saliva glands, I hate to break it to you, but there's nowhere else for it to go except onto the stage. I have no, I can't just swallow it. It's not an option for me. And so I'm not really sorry about the amount of saliva that comes out. I do my best to not spit at the crowd, but it does come onto the stage. I try to turn around and do it, but it doesn't always happen that way. It is what it is. You're 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 doing a show. You're performing. That's part of it. Whether you want it to be or not, it's there. Don't stand in the front. I don't know what else to say. Blue man group style. Give out ponchos in the first row. Right. If that, yeah. <laughs> wear, wear the mask. I don't know. People are still wearing the mask at the shows. Feel free. I don't care. It doesn't bother me if you wear the mask. I don't care. There's nothing that can change from the fact that I'm literally sprinting back and forth on stage and playing a Read instrument. It's all my mouth. I say that because it, it's not often, but like every couple months I have to read a, a someone be like, oh, the sax player was spitting all over the place. Like This isn't even them saying it to you in person. They like write a review or a comment online. One person said it in person one time, one time. Also, one time I used to wear smaller shorts. One time somebody told me that they did not like the shorts that I was wearing on stage. Because they were too small. And that they could see my genitals, like they could see that it was moving around in the shorts. I have my own feelings about that. I, I'm not trying to give you a free show here, lady, but I find it very interesting that 
some people get the pass with that and then some people don't. But I did move on from those shorts and I do wear slightly larger shorts now. I do. I wear Sophie running shorts, but they're sold. They're not like custom item. It's a running short that people wear when they're running and I wear them on stage because I'm running on stage. Anything else is impossible for me to perform in. I'm so sweaty and so restricted, anything else. And that just goes to back to what we were saying about some bands, like they have the coordinated look. Like I love the example of AFI in 2006. White jeans, white shirts, like all white. That worked for them. It's a really cool look, but that is not for everyone. We've tried stuff like that before. We did a run of shows a couple of years ago where we all wore the white. And we looked cool. It came out really awesome. Like I loved doing that. I love a gimmick. In more recent times, though, our conversation, which I do think is important for like how we look on stage, is like we need to just look good. Truthfully, we're older guys. And, you know, I do think that there's some urgency to like try to have a look and have that look not be like a homeless person on stage, at least for our band. That's pretty much the prereq. And all my guys have been doing a great job of like, keeping themselves groomed and like wearing a nice plain t-shirt or like a nice button down shirt, whatever it is, like wear what you want. But I think there's a level of importance to that for sure. Absolutely. I think there's a big sweet spot for most artists between wearing whatever you want and wearing uniforms. If we were wearing all of us pajama pants up on there, you, and you didn't know the band, you'd be like, this sucks. No shade to somebody who's up there who can make that work. Did I miss the memo? Is this, what is this? What, what's going on here right now? Also, I didn't mean to get a little fired up over some of the things that have been said, but I've never actually spoken about it. And for some reason, it just came into my brain and was like, these two things really kind of broke my heart a little bit. And I really wish that you didn't take an issue with it, but you're free to have an issue. I just, I don't really think there's anything I can do about them. So that's it. Probably never talk about it again. Well, I think it's good to get that out there, especially for other artists who are listening to maybe kind of think about like, hey, people are going to criticize things that they don't like. And that doesn't mean we have to change what we're doing. You know, we should think about it, but maybe it's valid. Maybe it's not. So something you mentioned a second ago is you were saying that you and the guys in the band, you're all a little older. And that was a really cool conversation we were having at your show a few weeks ago was about what fan bases to target. Because one of my favorite strategies is to target you know, like college-age kids who are fresh. They're still discovering music, so you're going to get a lifelong fan. And that works for a lot of people, but it's not for everyone. And you made a great point that when you're doing tours like with Less Than Jake, which if you toured with them at least once, if not multiple times before, and you're about to do a run with them in uh, November and December, and it's already November, which, by the way, this episode comes out the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, so the 22nd. So you might already be on that tour So this will be one week before the tour starts. Perfect. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, go look up the Less Than Jake and Keep Flying tour dates and please go to a show because Less Than Jake is phenomenal live. I've seen them like five or six times, I think. And I've seen Keep Flying once and it was literally the best local show, like the most energetic local show I've ever seen. And I'm not making that up. Like I'm being 100% real with that. As part of that conversation, you were saying, hey, a lot of the people at the Less Than Jake shows, or I think you also mentioned Real Big Fish, a lot of the older fans are really into discovering new music, our music. So can you kind of talk about that a little bit? More so now than before. Like now after the pandemic or? Yeah. I mean, I don't have the statistics to prove that, but I I, I think at least on my own perusing, I, I feel like an experience. I feel like a lot of the older bands end up playing with a lot of the similar things they've done. It kind of rotates like who they're playing with. So it's less bands, at least in that world, like new bands that get like recognized. I've been having a great time meeting people that are 35 plus years old. I also have a great time when I meet the people in their young 20s when we happen to get on a bill with bands that are like younger. That's great. I I like doing both. It's fun. Who should you target? Can't really answer that question like, You have to figure that out on your own. I know that we don't target teenagers because teenagers don't get our music. And it's not like it's, you know, I've accepted that. Like I look at our like stats on streaming and our under 18 is less than 1% of our streamers. So there's the answer. We don't really have any. I think some friends 
who have kids. Like the kids might listen to the band because our friend has kids 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Like things like that. But I don't know. You got to find your own way with that. And it changes based off where we are and who we're playing with. And like when we're doing like these small headline shows, like the DIY stuff, like it does change the genre bands we play with, the age of the bands we play with. Everything matters. Everything changes the factor of what is going to be the people that are coming out. I think it's just the most important to play to people who like want to give a shit about checking out new music. The people that I was excited to play for are the people who came out and were at these shows for doors because they were interested to see who the opening bands were. People who aren't interested are not coming at doors. And so you don't have to worry about those people. They're not going to show up till 845 anyway. And they're only there for the headliner or the last two bands. And so you don't need to waste any time with them because they're not there. They don't care. And that's fine. If that's how you are, I'm guilty of that. I've been to plenty of shows where I'm like, well, I'm not getting there until later. I can't always see every band. But I have also had many great experiences where I am either working a show or happen to be playing a show. Playing, I always watch every band. I always make sure to be in the room at least for a few songs of every band. Because again, you never know when you're going to be like, holy crap, this band I've never heard of. They have 18 followers on Instagram and they just blew my mind. You don't know. And for me, someone who sadly doesn't use streaming I, i'm just showing my age here i just still like just don't stream anything it's not like a edgy thing i just don't like i still find out of bands when i happen to see them live like when i see a band that i've never heard of i'm like i'm in i'm like damn i'll go check them out i use youtube for streaming again this sounds crazy but i i kid you not when i wasn't listen to a record i'll put it on youtube somebody makes like the mixtape of like all their music videos of that record and there's ads in between. It's like a nightmare, but like that's how I listen to a record. I will go and check the band out and or stay in touch with them and say, we got to play together again. We just played with an insanely awesome rock band in Ottawa that I just watched the whole set and was their older guys. And I was just, I know they're just a rock band doing it kind of for fun or whatever. And I was like, these guys were so good. And I will definitely make sure that we play another show with them. I would never have heard of them ever before that's why i love live music and that's why everyone who comes out to shows early and if you don't maybe the next couple try it out especially if you don't know the bands on the bill maybe don't even look them up just show up for doors and see it maybe you'll find something there maybe they'll say something before a song that will strike a nerve with you or maybe not but at least at least you gave it a shot that's my advice for someone who's still in love with live music and like needing live music to be a place to escape whatever crap is going on at home or at work or whatever. I think that's fantastic because I fully agree. And, you know, I stream, but I still have a massive iTunes library of like 11,000 songs or something. I'll still, I'll buy CDs from artists that like I fall in love with. And I'm like, okay, it's going on the phone, especially with bad data connections up here in Vermont. Like streaming is kind of unreliable if I'm in the car. But that all aside, Going to shows for the opener and staying for the headliner and being like, wow, they're actually really good. Or like you're saying, going for the headliner, but showing up early. And thinking back on the last like 14, 15 years, most of my favorite bands are artists that I saw live first before I really got into them. Maybe like three of my top 10 bands are artists that I liked before I saw them live with the exception of some where I like I had seen a previous project of that person or something like that. But I think that is such an amazing way to connect with people and especially in the older generation. Now I'm, I'm 29, so I'm almost 30. I'm older than Gen Z. You know, I'm not one of these kids that grew up with Apple music and all that. But especially when you're touring with less than Jake, all of these older bands that have been around for 30 years, which side note, fun fact, Vermont being tiny, Matt, from Real Big Fish is from Barrie, where I live. A town with like a population of 8,000 or something. Like, what are the odds? Not that I know him. I don't know him. I just know of him and that he's from here. I think he's in California. I don't know where he is. Yeah, I think he's out in LA because he was working with Feldy for a while. And he does so much music production now and like composing and like plays on every record. He crushes. He's unreal. Everything I've seen him put out sounds fantastic. But anyway, connecting with those older generations, you do that through live music. Because if they're listening to the radio, 
they're not hearing your music there. If they're on streaming, they're hearing the same 30 bands they've been listening to for the last 15 to 30 years. If you want to reach them, you have to play those live shows. And I think there's a big shift there because a lot of these newer TikTok artists, which no disrespect to them whatsoever, like I love that artists can go out and become viral. Magnolia Park, great example. They're doing big club tours now, like Simple Plan, Sum 41, all that stuff. But that is like such a minority, like most bands just are on that grind. So speaking of these tours, you mentioned before the interview that you've been friends with Less Than Jake for a while. So my question is, what happened first? Did you get on the tours with them first or did you already know them and that relationship helped you get on the tour? Already knew them? I'm not sure if that... Rela- I mean, I'm sure that has some influence because they know that we're just good people, but I, I never asked. In fact, one of the last days of the last leg, Roger came into the green room and said that he, they were trying to find another band because Cliff Diver couldn't do the whole run. And he he had said, why don't we take Keep Flying? I th- That may be the way that it was. I'm not sure. I just know that we got the cold email from their agents who at the time, their agents at the time are my homies. So I was like, I thought maybe it's from the agents. I don't know. But I think it took us about eight seconds to confirm. Yeah, that's not really the kind of thing you turn down unless there's something really wrong, like emergency level tragedy. At least for a band like us, it's like, are you kidding me? This is the best thing ever. So again, when we got asked to do these couple of quick shows on the east coast coming up it was like yeah what do you mean 10 more shows with less than jake on the east coast where we already have been playing for years and have our people and the ticket is like a reasonable ticket i think it's like 25 i think it's like yeah this is going to be amazing this is going to be the best possible thing that being said it was great to play on the west coast and all the mountain markets with them and Bowling for Soup because we never get to go all the way out there because when you're a small DIY band, it's a lot harder. We've only been there one time prior with Home Safe and those shows were fun, but a smaller thing. But um, being friends with them beforehand definitely made it probably easier on their end to be like, yeah, this is a great idea because they're fun. We did the last leg of their very long summer tour. And the vibe that I got is that our presence coming in, the way that we are off and on stage, which is I energy, I think rejuvenated that last week for for both the bands of like, wait a minute, I know we're at the end, but there's a newfound fire here right now. And now I'm fired up. For instance, on the last day, we all had our shirts off running around on stage during Less Than Jake back and forth. And then when Bowling for Soup closed out the night, Krista Makes, did the same thing, but alone, just across the stage with no shirt on. And he came over to us side stage and he goes, I need you to know I haven't taken my shirt off on stage in a really long time. And you guys got me fired up during our set. I felt the need. And I was thinking to myself, that's awesome. It is so awesome. Maybe you're just saying this, but maybe not. I love you, man. I've looked up to you since I was a kid. And yes, none of us are in the best shape and we're all on stage just taking the shirt off, having fun because who cares? It's so funny. I saw a comment on a, I think it was an Enter Shikari video from a festival and someone was like, oh, he doesn't shave his chest and he took his shirt off. I'm like, who cares? It's a summer festival. He's having fun. So I I think it's really cool that Chris came up to you and like was honest about that because that then turned around and gave that energy right back to you. We're a different generation, and also I didn't grow up with their circle of friends and bands. I wish I had. Often I think I wish I was born 12 years earlier because maybe I would have had a great time with rolling around with these bands like that era, but I wasn't. And I was just like, in that moment, I really did feel like, wow, we are one unit. And then after that, we're in the green room, and it was just like a beautiful nightmare. It was amazing. Like All of us just like ending the tour strong together, just hilarious. And it it was like, oh, this is my family. It felt just then, you know, like I've known these people my whole life and I've been doing this with these people my whole life. And it was only nine shows. To me, that's success. I'm assuming everybody went home with a big eating grin on their face like I did. I, I assume I went home like I am on such a cloud nine right now. Nobody could take this from me. Nope. And I think one of the highlights there is you've been touring, not with Keep Flying, but in the industry with various bands, working, playing, whatever, for at least 10 years from what I know. 2005. 
Okay, so 17 years. That is a long time to not get burnt out, not get jaded, and still love what you're doing. There is burnout. We do have burnout, myself included. There are days where I'm like, oh, no. Things like that, randomly peppered in, make all of it worth it. And they're just a great reminder of why we're here. And also the patrons and the friends that come up to you after and they're saying like, yo, I never heard of you before, but what you said on stage tonight and that one song or this song or the way you guys were moving made me feel like I was 20 again or, you know, I had someone pass away and you said this thing and it meant whatever it is, like those little moments make me as a artist and entertainer feel validated and reverses any like jadedness. It's humbling, actually. It's it's quite humbling. If this all ended tomorrow, that's okay. I, I felt so many different feelings through all of this, ups and downs. There's a reason why I and my bandmates are still here doing this and not really making money from it because we still love it more than if we were to be doing something else. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's your passion is this is what you do. and. Anybody can go sit in a cubicle for eight hours. I don't think anyone really enjoys that. That I could not do. I am past a place where I could ever possibly do that. I don't know how I would be able to do it. Just because the way that I am, the way my life has been, I don't know how that would be possible. Yeah, it'd just be like mind numbing. I think having that passion and that dedication, like there are so many artists who would, after just a few years of being on the road, not making any money, say, okay, that's it, we're done. You've been at this with this band for almost six years now. So many people would have given up by this point. Like, and many have during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic and currently, like I said at the beginning of this combo, a lot of people more recently have been like, all right, here's the towel. I'm not done, but I, I gotta like be done for a little while. Yeah, and no shame to those artists. If the pandemic or financial situations, financial stress said, hey, we can't tour anymore, I get it. But I also think it's really cool that you're not letting that stop you. Like you're still going out there and doing the thing. I can speak for the whole band when I say if I didn't have this, I have no idea the state of my mental health, which it's not a topic we need to talk about because it's not something that everyone wants to talk about. But I know that I need it. That's why it doesn't matter to me if it's five people or 5,000. I just need to like get it out of my system and do like a 25 to a 35 minute exercise slash play my music my songs, they mean a lot to me. And if they mean something to even three people, that that is enough for me. I'm, I'm bonding with other human beings via live music, which is something that I need. I don't drink. I don't really go to the bar. I don't bond with other people. I know what it is for people to do that. And I get that from playing songs and having somebody singing the words back. I have the same kind of feeling that you get when you're socializing in that way. I also get it when I do, when I play board games with friends, like playing board games also is another way that I have that with a smaller group. Like when it, and it needs to be smaller and more concise, having board game night where we're having food and playing, that is like very healing for me. It's like very healthy. It's a way to be social without just having to make small talk. That seems like a huge part of it, which I can totally relate to. I do not like small talk. Everyone at a show is like, we're here for live music. So it's like, Okay, and we're upbeat, happier band. Lyrically, we have some really sad and dark lyrics, but we're, we present it in a very lighthearted way. And so it's like I'm surrounded by other people that are similar to me, and it's just a really good environment. Why would I not want to be in that? I mean, I go to shows all the time that I'm not playing that I'm like, oh, I don't feel good in here. Like, there's only two people in here I know, and like, I, you know, I, there's like a different energy. It's a totally different energy plenty of shows I've been to that have not felt welcoming at all and very cold. That's fine. But like we do our best to make that the exact opposite. Peter, my drummer, will talk to almost every single person in a room. He'll go around and talk to almost every single person. You know, there's always the fans that want to talk extensively. And I'm sure you do talk to your fans. I know you do. That's we started talking at the show. But for some people, they can do that for hours. And others, it's like, hey, five minutes, that's enough. Like, I got to turn around, get a sip of water or seltzer or something and take a breather for a second. Everyone knows their own limit, right? All good. But um, I know as a kid, the bands that my 
old local band was opening up for when i'd see them watching side stage i remember how important it was to me and if they said anything at all after it meant a lot to me and also anytime i went to see a band that i got to speak to after the show i've never forgotten ever you know what i mean like and it's some of those bands has been well over 20 years Still, I haven't forgotten certain bands that I've toured with for work that have treated me well. I'll never forget that. And the opposite, certain bands that I didn't work for, but I was on tour with, you know, working for someone else who went out of their way for us. I'll never forget that either. Like, I, you don't forget the certain things, you know, the, the really good things and the really bad things generally are the things we remember the most. So I know for me with KF, it's like, I don't want anybody to leave feeling like not good or feeling like, they were rude or something that that sucks i've never had to hear that but like i don't want to hear that ever like if i hear that i get nervous i'm like what no way who how could you possibly feel that way what what happened yeah and i think that's part of the thing like your shows from the one show i've seen exude this positive energy the energy on stage is you're all having a great time like yeah the lyrics sometimes are sad but everyone there should be having a good time and i think that because your band is having a good time, it would be very difficult for them to put somebody else in a situation where they're not having a good time because the band is happy to be there. I've seen so many artists where the band is clearly not happy to be playing that show. There was a band on Warped one of the years I was out there. They're supposed to do the last two shows and they canceled. And I talked to them like the next year and I was like, hey, like people were looking forward to you. Why'd they cancel? And they said, oh, the singer didn't want to do it. So he canceled. And I was really bummed about that. But then I realized if he doesn't want to be there, then it's just going to be a lame set. It sucked to have them cancel, but it's not worth it. There may not be anything worse. That is brutal. When you can tell or anything, like there's been stuff on stage with bands that work for and with Keep Flying where it's like someone's pissed at someone and you could sometimes the crowd can tell and like that's not good either. But like it happens, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's tough to like to mask it. But um. When someone says something to you, you when you realize, oh, was it really that obvious? It's like you can't help but feel like I feel like shit. I wish that I was less obvious about being frustrated with like the monitors or something, you know, a bandmate performing the tempo too fast or something like this. I don't want you to think that like I'm up there pissed off. I'm not pissed off. I'm just trying to like course correct to fix this because we don't use click track. So it's like we're setting the tempos on stage and different, depending on the song, different members start the tempo. And it's like, if we play it too fast, it sucks. If we play it too slow, it sucks. You got to find the sweet spot. That's like where the song belongs. We crash into each other on stage. So the instruments get hit. And we fall out of tune and it'll be like not noticeable sometimes, but then sometimes midway through a song, it's like, dude, your guitar you must tune it. It fell out. You hit someone and it got out of tune. Please tune it. Yeah, it happens. And I, I think, you know, that's part of it is things go wrong and going with the flow. Having that very laid back production where you're just willing to accept it. You're like, hey, this happened. We're going to correct it. We're going to make it work. I think that's a great attitude for a DIY band without a huge budget to have. Because you can make it work. Unless the guitar snaps in half, you can make it work. There's always a solution to at least get you through those next few songs in the set. Oh, we, we have straight up played on full on all broken gear before. We ain't going to cancel, but it is what it is. Let's just figure it out. Like make the best of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, it's been just about an hour. So I want to wrap things up here because I know you got stuff to do, but I really appreciate you coming on the show. Before we drop all the keep flying links and tell people where to learn more. One last question is as a DIY artist who has been in the industry for 15, 16 years doing stuff both as an artist as a team member for various bands, what is the most important piece of advice, big or small, that you would give to an artist who's just starting out today? I know that's a huge question. It can be anything, mindset, money, whatever you think people should know that you wish you'd known 15 years ago. Honestly, the thing that gets asked to me a lot by friends, bands that are looking for advice, for some reason, we're in the era where a lot of bands think that they should wait for things i.e wait to put the new song up because they're trying to get signed or wait to book their own shows because they're hoping to get support on a tour or wait 
on whatever it is. I'm sure somebody could come on here and, and argue the other side of this, but I think that's a huge discredit to w- what you're doing because there is no time, especially post-pandemic, I don't know why anyone would wait or waste any time. There's no time to waste. If you're too silent for too long, people might just move on and forget about you. If you don't make the moves, if you're doing nothing and you're stagnant, like not only will I think it affect you on the internet where people forget, but like even like within the band, the dynamic between people, if you're not getting together, everything shifts. Everything drifts away when there's no attention on something, right? It's just a natural thing of life. So I've had a lot of friends over the last couple of years be like, well, I'm waiting on this. I'm waiting on this. And my response is always, why? Seriously, though, why? Why would you wait? It seems like there's no point in waiting. It's like, well, you know, well, what if? Well, what if? If if happens, then you'll deal with it. But if doesn't happen, then you did nothing. That goes for all any ambition, anything. I still kick myself that I haven't backpacked Europe. I've been to Europe a million times for work. I've had a couple of stay after a tour or started early before a tour. But I've always wanted to do the thing that a lot of friends have done, which is just simply go for like a month and like just do hostels with my backpack and just see the other things I haven't gotten a chance to see with the touring and go to the few other places that the bands don't go to. And I've just never done it because I just don't find the time. And I kick myself every time. I'm like, how am I not finding the time? Granted, now it's like I'm trying to really play rock and roll and like that takes my time. But like for a minute, I didn't I wasn't doing that. And I still kick myself for not doing it because now I have to worry, well, will I ever do it now? And I won't be satisfied. I'll Again, another 10 years from now, I'm going to be going, can't believe I still didn't do that. Like all I wanted to do was that and I simply could have and I just didn't. I chose not to. So I don't know. I just feel like any ambition with business or music or art or enter to anything. Why would you not? I recently asked a buddy if he can find out for me how to apply for the Blue Man Group. He asked me if I was kidding and I responded half, but also half not because I've always wondered how cool it could be if I was a Blue Man in one of the formations of the Blue Man Group. That would be fantastic. So I asked because you got to start somewhere. And asking can't hurt. What's the worst that can happen? Somebody says no. At least I asked. I could see myself doing that. Truly. This is not even a bit. It was a bit, and it evolved very far from a bit with my best friend. It's like, brother, what if you were in the Blue Man Group? It's like, what if I was? In Boston's pretty cool. Vegas. New York has one too, I think, right? Yeah. And they're all they're different people in these, you know. And different shows too, if I recall. They're each unique with some overlap. It's always been interesting to me. And I just, I'm like, well, I, you know, that kind of performance would be very fun for me. It's like high energy performance. And it's such a cool and unique performance. Like I've seen some people play online, the tubes and stuff, the PVC pipes. And it's like, okay, they've inspired that. But I have yet to see a band bring that out. It's still such a unique instrument. I'll be honest with keep flying, expect anything. Who knows? We've had so many different random instruments come up on that stage and just rogue play something that doesn't even work in the song at all. It's like, we're just up there like, who cares? This is funny. Like, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. I would not rule it out. Well, I hope that someday I'll see a Keep Flying show with the Blue Man Group tubes. I hope one day it's you. I hope it's you coming out with the pipes. (laughs) I have a slide whistle. I can bring the slide whistle. (laughs) Has somebody done that with us? I don't think so. Maybe, actually. Maybe one show. (laughs) Oh, well, next time you're in Vermont, I will bring this along if I remember. Bring it. We can figure out what key that thing is in and which song it would work on. Sounds like a plan. Well, John, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. For those who don't remember from just barely an hour ago, the introduction, John James Ryan from Keep Flying. You can find Keep Flying at Keep Flying Band on Instagram or their website is keepflying.band. It's not .com, it's .band. Anywhere else I should send people today to check out the band? That's it. Google? Yeah, Google has everything. Keep flying and you'll find everything. Yep. All right, perfect. Well, John, again, thank you so much. I hope you have an amazing day and enjoy your time in Chicago.